Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code MacVoices7. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this is part two of I don't know how many parts we're going to do in our sessions uh, and conversations about blogging, the, the state of blogging, what it is, where it's been, and where it's going. In the first uh, edition, our blogging expert, Karen Anderson, talked a little bit about the history of blogging and sort of brought us up to date. This time, we're going to discuss the, the issues of journalism and blogging, or blogging and journalism, depending on how you look at it. So first up, Ms. Karen Anderson. Karen, it's great to have you back. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chuck. So Karen, just for the folks who might not have seen the first episode, um, who are you and what do you do and why do I consider you an expert on blogging? Well, um, I, I'm a former journalist who went over to the dark side and became a blogger and I have a lot of perspective on, on both sides. Um, there's a lot I'm really nostalgic about uh, for journalism, and there's a lot of the freedom of blogging that I really love, uh, what it's uh, enabled me to do. I currently live in Seattle, Washington, and I work as a writer, and some of what I do is journalism, some of what I do is arts reviewing, and some of what I do is straight marketing, search engine optimization, writing, so, uh, which involves a lot of ghost blogging for corporate clients. And in, in the connection of that works to how I ran into Kathy through the uh, social media groups in Seattle. And also joining us, uh, Kathy Gill, who Karen just referenced. Kathy, first time on Mac Voices. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so I live in Linwood. And like Karen, um, I guess I could consider myself a former journalist, although some of my journalist friends say that I'm still a journalist, but I'm more of a columnist than a reporter. And I've been blogging since the beginning of blogging software, pretty much. I teach at the University of Washington, and uh, my students blog. I teach communication students, some are journalism students, some are not, um, but we use this as a form of public writing. And um, it's a different kind of writing when, you, when your students write for the public and they know eyes are going to see their work other than their teacher's eyes. Um, and then I also do some web development. I write for The Moderate Voice, PBS, Media Shift, and sometimes for GeekWire. Well, it's great to have you. It's great to have you both. Um, but I, th I think that maybe we should just just go ahead and get the letters coming in right off the bat. You know, why, why, why beat around the bush? What's the difference between blogging and journalism? And, and, I, and I say that from the standpoint of, Karen, last time when you were here, you kind of introduced us to the idea that, you know, there was a time when bloggers were just, just bloggers. And then they started kind of creeping up the, the credibility ladder and applying for press credentials and eventually getting them. And so now, you know, you have bloggers that clearly have journalistic credentials uh, to, to keep, keep using the word. But you also have people that really don't and frankly, I don't think shouldn't have those credentials because they don't live up to those standards, whatever those standards are. So I'll jump. Um, we have, so blogging, blogs, it's this word that means many things because it's a noun and it's a verb. So blogging is a platform. It's a form of communication. And just like you can have tabloid press on newsprint, you can have tabloid writing on blogs. You could also have caliber Pulitzer Prize writing on blogs, just like you can on newsprint. So one thing you have to stop back and say, like, what do we mean when we say blogging? Because of this whole, the term means so many different things. But if we're talking about individuals who use some sort of digital software that does reverse chronological journaling, which is kind of blogging, um, 
then we, we have to say, are these folks committing acts of journalism? And do they need to have this institution that we call the news media behind them in order for us to consider them credible? I, I want to jump in. I want to talk. I want to talk about journalism um, as as a, a a trade, a profession, mm. and it involves at its root when you're a journalist, even if you're in a tiny small town newspaper in Maine, or whether you're someone who went to journalism school and went to work for the New York Times, you're entering at some level in that in that experience into a contract, and it's a contract with readers. And you enter in this contract because you either have a journalism professor or you have some incredibly awful cigar chomping editor mm -hmm. and they are teaching you this contract. Um, I will always remember a, a fairly cavalier young woman who was very talented at rooting out interesting things who became a journalist and she came into a more traditional newsroom and she didn't want to write obituaries. She didn't want to do this stuff. She wanted to go out and root out crime and they put her on the obit desk, and she turned in an obit one night that referred to a mass of Christian burial. A mass of Christian burial instead of a mass of Christian burial. And the editor, of course, corrected it and hit the roof. And he said to her, you know, people only die. You know, they're born, they get married, they die. They're in the newspaper three times. It's our, it's our duty to get it right. Now, this is where I'd say that journalists have a very different upbringing than bloggers, because bloggers generally do not get the feeling of having the obligation to get it right, nor do they have the problem of it being printed and remaining there forever, staring them in the face. They can just go correct the blog. So, but now we're coming back to what's the institution around which this person is writing? So are we talking about an independent blogger someone like, say, Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo. Um, are we talking about Wonkette, a blogger, part of a national media organization? So that's why I get back to that. We have to like say, what is this? Is this like newsprint? Because we can write great things on newsprint or we can write stuff that's not even worth lining the bottom of the birdcage. But do bloggers get trained? Is there blogging training now? So, what do you, I mean, so can we go back to like defining what even we mean by bloggers? Sure, sure. I, yeah, sure. People who publish stories online. Okay, that's broader than I would use, but oh, oh, okay. How do you differentiate that from, oh, you know, somebody who writes science fiction and publishes it online? Because that's fiction. It's oh. not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not logging reality. Okay. So. But what? Wait um, a minute, what? One one man's reality is another man's fantasy. Well, but I'm thinking of blogging. Like somebody has a blog, and it's you know Susie's life, and one mm -hmm. of the things she starts blogging about is. Uh, the people going in and out of the house next door and describing who's going into her neighbor's house. That's blogging. But it's right. not journalism. But she might find herself in a position where she's committing an act of journalism. So, um, so, yeah. so we you know, we've taken away the cost, the fixed cost of the printing press. One of the reasons that we had the institution was because it was so dadgum expensive. The ink and the presses and the paper and the distribution system and all of that. So you had a, you wound up with a monopoly and it was a monopoly simply because of the cost of the business. That whole joke about, you know, don't fight with someone who buys their ink by the barrel. Um, and now we don't have that. So, so we, we've got done away with the friction of the printing press or the television station. So, because you can commit an act of journalism with video, it doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be words like, you know, you and I. You and I are you, writers. You know, one of the things that strikes me is we are comparing 
blogging journalism to newspapers as we knew them in the 60s and 70s. But if you look back 50 years earlier in newspapers, there were cities that had seven or eight newspapers. And one newspaper might be coming out and saying what a terrible person Mayor Daly was, and the other person thought Mayor Daly was a saint. Whereas now, if you still get a newspaper in Seattle, there's one newspaper. You read the same opinion and the same and that, coverage. Right. And that's because of economics. Newspapers, newspapers used to be more like blogging. Well, certainly newspapers um, pre-television, pre-radio, they, um, the publisher had a pulpit, right? I mean, which you still have, but you, we hadn't yet moved to the consolidation that we have today. Um, and that consolidation was inevitable based on the economics of information. So it costs just as much to produce one newspaper as it does to produce a million newspapers. I'm not talking about the printing part. I'm talking about the producing part. So you have this really high fixed cost and really low marginal cost. I just, I am also trained as an economist. Forgive me if I get into too much economics speak. Um, but that, that market structure is what encouraged the development of single newspaper towns. Because it's just, that's just like sort of life. Now we have the internet where that, that fixed cost of production has moved to almost zero. You know, what's ironic is that the, the shrinking of the newspapers is what opened the way for bloggers doing journalism because if the newspapers were actually covering things well and competitively nobody would care what the bloggers said but now people are forced to read bloggers like um clark humphrey and people like that mm -hmm. in seattle yes. and and um the, the, that wonderful political blog uh the one that goldie runs yes horses yes horses we can't say mm -hmm. the name but horses um and people read that because they're trying to figure out what actually happened in the state legislature yes. and he's telling it like it is and with the newspapers you might get one story out of state legislature a day if that so right. yeah. it is and it, and it may be coming off the wire service right it's going to come from ap or reuters um but that's again that's that fixed cost of information thing and so if we if we look at the neighborhood blogs like the West Seattle blog or the Capitol Hill blog or those that are um, modeled after news organizations and they are performing what we think of as traditional acts of journalism, right? So they're talking about what's going on in City Hall, they're talking about crime, they're talking about new businesses opening, um, births, deaths, and they're, also, uh, they're, and they're fact checking. They're also fact yes, checking a lot. So they're, they're, they're fact checking. Um, they, that is kind of like what you described at the turn of the 20th century when there were lots and lots and lots of newspapers in every major uh, every major market. They, okay, so you can say that they came to life because of the consolidation, the Atlanta Journal in Atlanta, the Chicago Tribune, the Seattle Times, the New, well, New York is an exception because it's so big. Um, so, so yeah, it's also the advertising model because when those newspapers got so big, it cost so much to run an ad that your local mom and pop um, dry cleaner or restaurant, they weren't going to buy an ad. They couldn't afford to buy an ad. And besides, they don't need the coverage of the Seattle Times, right? So, yeah. They only need the coverage of the West Seattle blog because their people only come to them that are local. So it's just all kinds of stuff. But then, so that's like the structure. But then if we go back to that thing where we talk about ethics, the fact we were talking about at the beginning, the making sure that things are truthful, that they are balanced, um, that if they have a bias, that the bias is articulated. Um, I can give examples where bloggers do that better than traditional media. 
and I can give you examples where it's the other way. So we're in this time of change, big change. Um, The cool thing is you can start a business either as a business like the West Seattle blog or Talking Points Memo, um, or you can just start talking about your neighborhood. And you can do that on Facebook. I mean, you could actually have a blog-like thing for a neighborhood on Facebook that would be the stuff that would never make the press. Who's going to have a yard sale this weekend? I have a question. Yeah. We all remember there were (laughs) bloggers running all over the place, and the journalists were furious. And then suddenly the journalists started blogging. Well, when some did, did journalism start hating bloggers and get on the bandwagon? Well, I think it was the publishers who hated them because they saw uh, the competition, right, for this, for this digital market. Because we talk a lot about the declining readership of newspapers, and the fact is newspapers have more people reading them today than ever before. They're just not reading a paper. They're reading a website and one or two stories, not this packaged product that lands on the front porch. So it's debundled. Um, you know, you, you, we, if you want to just read sports, you can just read sports. And you can probably get better sports coverage yeah, by somebody who loves baseball than by the Seattle Times. Chuck, how has this worked for all of the Mac magazines? How have they been affected by blogging? Oh, well, I mean, I, I think that most of the magazines have turned, uh, Macworld jumps to mind that, mm-hmm. you know, they they saw the, the trend early and they moved a lot of their content online, recognizing the advantages of doing so. And I certainly don't want to put myself in the, in the spokesperson mm-hmm. position for Macworld. But, you know, to watch the shift away from the paper so that the paper is secondary mm-hmm. or the paper now serves a little bit different purpose than it traditionally did. And you get the news and you get the, the, the breaking news. Mm-hmm. And frankly, you get more content online. Um, well, and, and know, then it, think of tidbits, right? I mean, tidbits exactly. started as an online publication and it's, I consider it journalism, but it's, but it's never been in oh, yeah. print, right? But, but, but Kathy, You've, you've used the phrase and committed an act of journalism a number of times, which sounds like something really almost nefarious. Um, <laughs> what, what do you consider an act of journalism? And to take your example and say, you know, or if, if I start uh, writing about what's, you know, who's coming and going in my neighbor's house, why is that not an act of journalism if I am reporting it accurately? may not be of interest to anyone, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. It, if I'm doing it accurately, is that not an act of journalism? I believe it is because I have a very broad definition of what journalism is. And this is based on um, a former dean of journalism school, Mr. Carey, who said journalism – is our collective day book, our collective day book. And so you can quote, commit an act of journalism in quote and not be a journalist. And let me give you an example. Now, the first one that everybody talks about really in academia is the um, tsunami in Japan. So the rest of the world learned about the devastation and the heroism of people and just everything pretty much from citizens in Japan who happen to have more video cameras per capita than anybody else in the world. And so those folks were telling us, this is my world. This is what has happened to me. And that's journalism. But when the tsunami passed, they went back to talking about their cat or cooking or whatever their passion was, which was the reason that originally drew them to communicate stuff. Now, um, Karen and I on the phone earlier, she said something about um, me being up all night. And I have actually done that now two nights in the past week because for some reason the story in Austin, Texas has 
yanked my chain. And the story in Austin, Texas is that the legislature is in a special session and as part of that special session, the governor is putting forth some controversial um, legislation regarding women's health and abortion. And like 1,500 women showed up on Sunday at the Capitol in Austin. Think about that for a moment. 1,500 citizens showing up in any Capitol on a Sunday, right? And the reporting that came out of that day-long 15, 16-hour filibuster um, came from people who aren't journalists. But they were there. They took pictures. They shared tweets. They uh, shot video. And they shared it mostly on Twitter, but, you know, some on Facebook. And if you think about, okay, so how do I know if this person is telling me the truth, right? If something really out there is shared, like the fact that one of the prime sponsor legislators compared a rape kit to abortion, uh, kind of in a way that suggested she did not know what a rape kit was. If only one person had said that, we would all go, eh, didn't you just make that up? But when you've got independent people all on site saying, oh my gosh, this woman just said this, suddenly there's some veracity there. So that's the other thing that makes this whole area, and now I'm moving beyond blogging, right, to the whole thing about um, sharing news of the moment through tweets and Facebook status updates and Tumblr blogs and all of that, vines and video, and how do we decide who's telling the truth? And this goes back to Karen's point from very early. And I, I don't think it was so much that it was this pledge of the journalist is going to be truthful so much as it was a promise. Trust us. We're going to vet the news for you. And now you have to vet the news yourself. Okay. But, Karen, let's, let's take the, the, the Texas situation. I would assume that if you're taking a lot, and by the way, you know, I have no dog in this fight, so <laughs> please, folks, no letters on this one. On some of the other stuff, sure, but not this one. If, if you have 1,500 citizens showing up for that, don't you think that, that the reporting coming from those 1,500 citizens is almost automatically going to be biased because they're there to protest what is going on to, mm. and, and therefore an ad, advance a particular agenda? And this is where I think sometimes mm -hmm. the blogging thing breaks down a little bit, uh, especially when compared to journalism, that there is there is no objectivity. I mean, I, I've seen bloggers who mm -hmm. who are very proud proud to say, "I'm not a journalist; I'm a blogger," because they're a columnist. There's actually what they're saying is, "I'm not a reporter; I'm a columnist," because columnists are paid to have an opinion. Reporters are paid to, quote, tell us the truth, end quote. And I would argue that there is no such thing as objectivity. There is this thing that American media pretend to bow to called the altar of objectivity. Um, it's not possible to be objective. Every, you know, the, every word choice is based on your life experience. I want to say that that this is another case where I think journalism created its own problems. When I was trained as a reporter in 1980, um, and at the first paper that I went to, if you did not have um, a reaction from the other side, you're st you were in trouble. I mean, if you were a reporter who repeatedly said, oh, I couldn't get a hold of the other side, or blah, 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 the other side, you were not in the business very long. And now, when I read the newspaper, 
There is no attempt whatsoever. You would never even know there was another side. And again, I think that the leeway that we're giving blogging is because journalism has really abandoned what used to be its mandate of objectivity. It doesn't even make a pretext towards it anymore, which is very sad. Well, okay, let me be devil's advocate here. So, um, objectivity can easily provide a false veil of balance. And the big issue here is climate change. The way climate change is reported in the United States versus how it's reported in the rest of the world. Um, because if you give, if you assume one that there are only two sides, which is usually a false assumption, um, then you say, I'm going to give both sides equal weight. You're now saying that you are saying as the reporter, both of these points of view have equal merit. That is how American media presented the science of, of climate change for years and years and years and years and years. And yet the scientists were really ticked off because the majority science opinion was not that things were actually balanced. The other side was an incredibly fringe point of view in, in the science field. So is that being But truthful? Kathy, in every argument, each mm -hmm. side thinks that even admitting there is another side is wrong because how could you possibly admit there was another song, side because they are non-scientific or because they're religious fanatics? I mean, they, they all have a good argument about why you shouldn't talk to the other side. And I believe the hallmark of a journalist, of a journalist is not to tell people what they should think, but to tell them what people in the field are thinking. Yes. I am the person who goes in and talks to the scientists and says there are a couple of different things going on I, and really yeah. at that point people have to make up their own mind about if one guy is from harvard and the other guy is from you know such and such community college there may be a difference in the quality of the information but i don't think the reporter actually has to get to the truth i just think they have to give people facts so that they can ex explore the issue further i you don't get any argument from me there, but that is a different kind of reporting. So this, so what you and I are now talking about is we're talking about uh, quote feature writing. We're talking about magazine writing. We're not talking about the quote news of the day. We're talking about analysis and helping to explain. We could call it an explainer. Could we like copyright that? something not copyright trademark trademark um the um and I, I actually i think the blogging world if we now make that be the digital communication world uh does that better and they do it better because of hyperlinks because if it is if it done well and you claim x you link to a primary source and then I could go find out if you actually represented X appropriately or not. You know, it's funny. I have seen some, some lazy bloggers who mm. will, they see something controversial. And what they see is something that says, the five ways that you're going to make your make <laughs> your money with your, this five mistakes small businesses make. And then the blogger says, for those of you who are you know, worried about your business, take a look at this person's guide to, to business practices and you look at it and it's garbage and i have actually emailed a bunch of people and said did you actually read the original source uh no i was in a hurry so the, and that now what i did to them is what the editor would have done to the reporter yes so yes the, the, I'm, I'm missing in blogging you're lacking the mentoring factor you're you're, li you're lacking that cigar chomping editor saying that's stupid, that's wrong, or how would you expect a 21 year old blogger to know as much about communication as a 55 year old blogger who's been communicating for all these years? It's difficult. Okay, so so let's let's try to boil this down to some practical advice, <laughs> because it's, uh, Karen, that's that's an interesting idea that 
it sounds like now we have to all become our own cigar chomping editors. That's what and, I said. Yeah. We have to we now have to vet our own news. We don't have that cigar chomping editor to vet it for us. So how do we go about that? How do you establish or determine the credibility of someone? What, oh, there's reams, reams of material on how to assess the credibility of an article. Librarians have this stuff. That's actually how I got started in this whole field back in the 90s. But we don't teach it in school. We, we don't, don't teach critical thinking. And we, we certainly don't seem to teach a lot about how to assess a message, right? And be able to deconstruct a message and decide what should I believe this or not? So that's a problem, I think. Um, and then we, but if you've got comments enabled, you do get that cigar chomping editor <laughs> from the readers. Now, sometimes the comments are, but sometimes they help you see an angle or perspective or maybe even a piece of research that you didn't even know existed. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace, the beautiful and intuitive website platform that allows anyone to easily create professional web pages, blogs, online stores, galleries, and more in a simple, intuitive interface. We are covering some of the features you get automatically when you build your website with Squarespace things that are just part of the package at no extra cost. Things like custom designs, easy image management, social media integration, galleries, blogs, calendars, pages, and Squarespace's ability to deliver your site scaled to whatever device it is viewed on. You would think we would be running out of things to talk about. Hardly. Squarespace has amazing capacity to handle even the most demanding website traffic. If your website ends up on the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN, and every other major news network on the web, it won't go down. Squarespace automatically allocates more resources so your site stays up and stable, ready for all that incoming traffic. Maybe photos are your thing. With Squarespace's Dropbox Sync, all you need to do is put collections of images in your Dropbox and have them automatically synced with your Squarespace site with just one click. Or perhaps you want to gather up data from your site's visitors. Squarespace's forums block supports more than 15 different data types, addresses, currency, email, and more. Those are just a few of the reasons to build your site with Squarespace. But don't take my word for it. Go to squarespace.com and try it out for 14 days free. No credit card required. Build your site, play with all the tools. Then, when you're ready to pull the trigger, Use the code MACVOICES7 to take 10% off your first order. That's MACVOICES7 to get 10% off your bright, shiny new Squarespace site with all the features we've talked about and many more. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Thanks to Squarespace for supporting this edition of Mac Voices. You know, Chuck, there's something that... There's something I'd like to bring up that involves quoting myself, quoting Kathy. And <laughs> this is very funny. It, it's, it involves a blog post I wrote called Theft by Headline. And Kathy was one of the people who brought this theft to my attention. And what it was about was there was a story, actually it was a blog, uh, and it goes back to a blog post by a man named Nick O'Neill. And Nick looked at a New York Times article, and the New York Times article had a very run-of-the-mill headline. Forbes saw the New York Times article, and Forbes magazine wrote a summary of the article, referring back to the New York Times. And the Forbes summary got 680,000 page views. The reason, O'Neill pointed out, was that the Forbes headline writer, quote, cut out the crap and got to the real shocker of the story. And indeed, that was exactly what happened. And what was interesting there was that the journalists at Forbes took a lesson from bloggers. They learned how to write that headline that makes people click through. The New York Times did it old school. They assumed they had a captive audience. 
but no one bothered to click through to read their story because times have changed. And I thought that was a real interesting yeah. example of, of, of journalism taking a cue from blogging. Yeah, but you know what? There, there's, there's a word for that. Um, I think it's called link bait. Sometimes. It was link bait. And, and but it was good link bait. Well, okay. So um, well, that's an interesting question right there. Can there be good link bait? Can you just have yes. a better restatement of a headline or a story? It's than maybe good headline religion? writing. The New York Times got lazy. This is a, ch a really an example of people used to write good headlines when you had a choice of which newspaper you were going to buy from the newsboy. But when there was no need for choice anymore, the headline writers got lazy. I, I think if we go back to Karen's example about the, f the five best things you should do as a small business person or whatever, right? So that story, that's where I see link bait, where you see a headline that promises something it does not deliver. In this case, I, don't, I wouldn't call the Forbes headline writer or summary writer um, bad, assuming they linked back to the New York Times story. Journalists have done this from day one. Radio guys and TV guys ripped off the morning paper and read it on the air, right? So yes. you're rewriting somebody else's stuff and you're putting it in um, the language of the medium. And you, and you reach more people with the story, but they get it more superficially. Is that bad? I, I did this yesterday. I'm like the New York Times. When I write a piece, because I'm doing analysis, I'm doing that thing we talked about where you've got this story and you, the reader, you need to know these different things. And that makes it long. And people don't read long as a general statement. I did not want to lead with the story about the legislature who put her foot in her mouth because that did. because that did not seem appropriate i had it buried at some ungodly hour this morning i pulled it out and made it its own story you know, this brings up another very important issue around blogging. Ka Ka uh, Karen, is can, can I interrupt okay. just because I, there's mm -hmm. one thing that Kathy said that I wanted wanted to ask about, and that is that right now it's, it, it feels like most established journalism seems to be going shorter and shorter and shorter uh, in, in, into very, you know, little bite-sized pieces. Blogging, it seems to be going the other way. That there longer. are longer pieces and longer pieces. And I, th I think that's a very interesting trend. And if we assume that we know what a blog is and what journalism is, that the established journalists are going, you know, and are under pressure to, to make it those bite-sized pieces where the bloggers can be a bit more verbose, sometimes too verbose. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the constraint of the inches of the newspaper or the minutes or seconds of the television and radio story. But but they Kathy, also you have you have no. un, unlimited um, unlimited space online. So admittedly, yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, what I mean, what yeah, but I'm talking about the journalists. I mean, they yeah. can they can they may have to winnow down. In fact, I know plenty of tech journalists, especially who say, you know, here's my here's my edited version that goes in the paper, and then here's my triple length version on right. my blog. Right. And yeah. so you know where does where does that where does that fit in and what should we be looking at should we be should we be consuming the one in the paper or should we be saying i i okay you've got my attention with this i want to go over there and read the whole thing who are you so that's the real question who are you because everybody doesn't need to know everything chuck the, the blogs are really trade magazines what the blog is, is Kathy, what Kathy was writing for, Policy Wonks. Yes. That original thing was for people in, she was writing for people who know all the basics that we've covered today and who are interested in seeing more examples of how this is playing out and what each new example is teaching us. The story about the 
the ill-informed uh, dumb Texas legislator is a whole other different kind of story that goes on to, under the basic, can you believe someone said this kind of thing. So news. It's two different news. audiences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, when I wrote for about.com and I, I was the U.S. politics uh, blogger for about.com for uh, five years, um, I, my editor and I regularly got into this fight because he wanted me to write more of these things because they get clicks. And I wanted to help people understand what it was they needed to know about an issue. And those are in conflict. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Karen, I'm sorry I interrupted you. What, what point did you wanna make? No, the comment I wanted to make was about the, the rise of blogs as trade journals. Mm -hmm. that, that blogging is, the audiences have gotten, you know, it, it's, I only follow things that I want to follow. I look at the general newspaper and say, I don't care about the majority of the stuff. I just care about particular issues that I follow. And blogs, particularly blogs that, that concatenate the day's news right. and those, um, a lot of us do these paperly daily newspapers that pull together what the people we follow are saying. And they end up becoming very topic interesting um th that's trade publications and we all go and we look at at the ones that we're we're into and not follow other stuff i generally would not follow texas politics unless it had something to do with molly ivins so. well i tell you i missed molly this weekend i thought you were I doing a seance i thought you were doing a seance <laughs> to bring her back last night <laughs> yeah i don't know what happened last night um and that's the other thing. It's kind of like um, this goes back to the transforma transformative nature of the communications medium. And it comple completely collapses time and space. And so, I mean, when, when, when Karen and I were green behind the ears or wet behind the ears or whatever the trite metaphor is that I'm not thinking of and just starting out as journalists we wouldn't have been covering something that was 3,000 miles away it just would not have been possible and our audience wouldn't have been interested in it and then and today we can know what's going on in Egypt we can know what's going on in Syria we can know what's going on anywhere if we choose to. Okay, so, so, so I guess to answer the question, I mean, is, except for the acts of journalism, except for the, the, the ethics, which frankly at times I question for, you know, many mainstream journalists, um, do we have a clear delineating line here or do we really, I mean, because I, I guess I feel like we're, we've crossed into an, another area here of curation where if, if, you're, if you're quoting, and, and Karen, you used the, the paperly example where you're taking the, the people you follow and you're sort of distilling it down to the things that you think are most interesting and most important. So, you know, the funnel keeps getting smaller because um, we I guess we all take it all in and hey, I'm probably as guilty as the next person because I take my Twitter stream and I retweet what I think is important or interesting. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm I'm curating there. Is, is You're that, an editor. You're I, an okay, editor. Okay, so does that make, is that different than, um, than blogging or am I just, am I curating on a different platform? It's editing. It's, it's editing. editing. I think you're, you're curating on a, a different microblog. platform. You're, you're working on a different platform, small, you know, but, but the fact is whether we're helping people know um, how to get the best out of your MacBook Pro or how to get the best out of your iPad or the, the thing that I'm doing right now is writing a little ebook for educators. How can you use the iPad in your classroom to help your workflow? to engage your students. So how can this piece of technology make your life easier as a teacher? 
as you see it. Well, yeah, so here's here's what I think. Here's my experience. Here are other teachers' experiences. And so I, I'm curating. And in this case, it's it's really like a trade publication kind of curation in the traditional sense. But we're doing it with every subject. And if you care about something, you can become the expert about it. Yeah. I, it's it's amazing all the the books that people are writing and they're just doing it people are just doing it and there's some really and not all of it is going to you know go appeal to a million people on amazon but a lot of people are doing small local stuff that's enormously important to the people in their school and their community and stuff like that because yeah. the cost of the printing press has vanished this is all the digital economics of information, the economics of digital information. When, when so much of the online publishing started, and or maybe after it got rolling, we talked about the democratization of media and of the message and being able to get your message out, whether it was good, bad, intelligent, not so intelligent, you know, biased, not biased, whatever. Like you said, the, the, the printing press is, you know, I mean, the, the cost of the printing press is gone. For you know a nickel ninety eight, I can have a website, and in fact, in a lot of cases, I can have a free website, right. and and post whatever it is that I want. And if I if I don't want a website, then I can create um, an account on Twitter or an account on Facebook or Google Plus, and basically do the same thing there, just on another platform. In some right. cases, arguably easier than it is to maintain my own website. So I have the 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 advantage or the possibility of getting my message out there, whatever that yes. message is. Is that, I mean, I don't even know, is that a good thing? Is, do we, are, are we still democratized? Or has this just created a new medium where the, the top bloggers, the top most credible bloggers, um, some of the people you've mentioned and, and a lot of others, kind of rise to the top? I mean, is, is it true democratization or is it just another uh, another way that a pecking order has been established. I am of the Chris Anderson, the Wired Magazine, Chris Anderson, um, long tail devotee. So you will always have the big popular blogs for whatever subject there is, or big popular website, or big popular whatever. They'll be the, the person that everybody goes to because it's like the New York Times for that subject. But that does not mean that other voices aren't important or won't have an audience. Karen's point that she just made. The, again, the difference is how engaged, and I use that verb here as meaning mindful, uh, actively mindful, how engaged is a person in the subject. There's a lot of things that you just really want somebody else to tell you what it is you need to know. Right? And you don't want, you just like, you can't fill your mind up with all the details. You just want to know, or maybe you just need to know it right now because you're getting ready to buy a stereo system. And then, and then, to, and then next year, like, you, you want that stereo system to last a while, right? So you don't want to have to know about this next year. So that's, that's grazing, I guess. And this technology makes that really, really easy to do. And yet the people who care about stereos and the difference between whatever, see, I can't even like tell you like how you're supposed to pick this stuff. Um, they know who the important people are. It's like, it's like photography. Which camera do I buy? There's like three websites that I'll go to and, and see what their reviews are and what people are saying about that. I, same thing with my motorcycles, right? If I'm getting ready to go, I, I want to buy a dual purpose bike and go to Alaska. There's like one forum on the internet I'm going to go to and I'm going to see what those guys, and yeah, they're mostly guys. I'm going to see what those guys say about the current crop of motorcycles. 
One of the things I'm I'm liking about my what I call I call Facebook microblogging. I find it so amusing that all these people say to me, "Well, I'm much too busy to do a blog, and who'd be interested?" Are the same people posting every five minutes on Facebook? <laughs> and it so happened that one one of my friends, who's this delightful science fiction curmudgeon, who when he retired, his hobby began sailing on tall historic ships, and he's the safety officer. For his tall historic ship, so when his ship ship sank, he was yes, he was there, and the coast guard did live video of the rescue, and everyone was looking at the coast guard stuff, but most people don't know how to take a screen capture, yes. so I was taking screen captures of the coast guard rescuing him, and posting it to his Facebook page, which was like <laughs> great because I was documenting his experience and. And I was, it, it, and then a friend of his got really into it and took over the blogging while he was being briefed and everything. And then was writing about their experience with Der Spiegel and the other news outlets that were trying to buy his story, which were coming to the door and knocking on the door. And it became just the most fascinating story. And it was that all spun out on Facebook. Because there was no it, blogging at all. So, what you just described. Is, is, is the reduction of friction. Okay? So friction is anything that makes something hard to do. And what Facebook, I mean, as much as, I mean, I have this hate-love relationship with Facebook. Um, Facebook makes it easy. YouTube made it easy to share videos. Facebook made it easy to share stuff with your friends and family. Reducing Apple makes things easy, right? Apple is like known for reducing friction. And when, when you reduce friction and make things easier to do, people move to your platform. And that's why people do this on Facebook. Yeah, but do we... Uh, do I'm we... interested in seeing... Okay, we're not letting Chuck talk spots. No. <laughs> do, <laughs> but do, do we risk just inundating ourselves with noise? We always have. Yeah. I'm not, well, I'm not sure that's, that's an answer, Kathy, because... Now, I mean, the opportunity for, for noise is so great. And yet, I guess but, at the same time, I can be more selective about what I choose instead of having to go to a newspaper or newspapers or magazine or magazines and get and, their barrage of stuff. I can then, pick out then, just what I want. But then think about it from radio. So let's just move away from words and let's go to entertainment. Let's talk about radio for a moment. There was a time in this country when we were all young where local radio stations were important and they played a mix of music that was probably unique to a region, if not to something smaller than that. Today, most of the radio stations are owned by a handful of companies and they all play the same music. Now, is it noise for me to be able to go to Pandora and listen to music that I cannot hear on my local radio because there's no station that plays it. No, I would call that choice, and that's a really, really great point. When I have a headache, I listen to a local radio station in Arizona that broadcasts a farm team baseball game because I like that kind of announcing when I have a migraine. I like to listen to ball games. And it has to be a real announcer. Okay. And I happen to pick up a, a station in Arizona, and I love it. I'll try that the next time I have one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that we we have solved anything here. It's been an interesting discussion. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know exactly I don't what think this is solvable. Well, this is not solvable. I, I'm not sure what I expected coming into this discussion, but I sure didn't get it. Whatever that was. Um, <laughs> I, I got I got a whole lot more questions, and I guess it sounds like the definitions are all blurred. the The responsibility more than ever is on the individual to to curate, to edit, to decide what to to look for, and even to pick out you know two or three sides of the story and, and go looking for them if it's relevant enough to you. Because it's it's so easy. That, I guess that's the thing that kind of concerns me just a little. Is it's so easy to get bogged down in this and 
to just throw your hands up and say, you know, I just can't take responsibility for gathering all the information from all these diverse sources. And that is why most Americans get their news from their local television station. Now, that's true. Most Americans get their news. And here I'm talking about the stuff that we started with, right? The news of the day that you need to know to be a good citizen from their local TV station. That is 30 minutes of airtime, which is now, what, 20 minutes of, quote, news. And most of that is sound bites and weather and sports and the cat that went up a tree or the bridge that fell in the water. Um, So people are busy. They're stressed. They're overworked. People have two jobs. They come home. They need to put food on the table for the kids and the spouse, um, do the laundry, escape to the television to kind of chill out, go to bed and get up and do it all tomorrow. There isn't enough attention time for them to be, to care about every possible public issue. I mean, there just isn't. That's for wonks. And even wonks don't care about all of them. We become little subject matter experts. The, the thing that really concerns me, and this is, I'm putting my educator hat on now, is the fact that we're in this transition period and we've left a lot of people adrift without a skill for making the assessment of who do I trust? Who do I trust on this one subject that I have decided is the one I need to care about? Yeah. Trust no one. Yeah, well, <laughs> at some point you got to trust somebody. <laughs> Karen? Chuck, I'd like to sort of tie that up um, for people who are listening to watching the show, who are interested in some of the really good statistics that Kathy has brought in to, to support her views on this. I'd like to refer them to the Pew Center's uh, Internet and American Life Project. They look at everything, particularly issues around attention. Uh, You know, you hear all this, people are spending too much time doing this, they're using their phones too much, they're doing this on the internet. Pew actually is doing research and finding out what people of all ages, all ethnicities are doing. And one thing I'd like to say is people are spending less time with the TV and more time on computers, which is a very interesting thing for this blogging and microblogging type communication, people are finding time to read it. And that's and that's wonderful because television is passive. You sit back on the sofa, you're a long way from the TV, and it projects stuff at you. Interacting with a screen, whether it's the small one on your phone, the medium-sized one on your tablet, or your laptop or or PC is active and you're closer to it and you're engaged with it in a way that you never can be with television. So I'm like all for this change. Um, One more place for information, I would say go to Pointer, P-O-Y-N-T-E-R. Pointer is doing the kind of research into news, specifically news. How do we, we as journalists, do a good job, right? Who's doing a good job? How do you tell a good story uh, on video? How do you tell a 15-second video story, right? I mean, those kinds of things you'll get from Pointer, and then you get all of that, why you have to know about those things from Pew. All right. I'll have links in the show notes to both of those because they both sound very interesting. I think it's especially interesting because I've also seen some t- statistics and I haven't, <laughs> I, I have not validated them. I have not fact checked them that say, you know, people are watching more TV than ever, which I personally don't believe, you know, I, I, but you just, you don't know. But, but certainly the interaction thing here, I, I guess that's almost the takeaway is you know, get involved with educating yourself if, with, with everything from, Different points of view. I mean, follow, you know, follow the left, follow the right, follow the center. 
and uh, when it comes to politics and, and I, I, don't, I don't even know, know what else to say. And that means you have to acknowledge, and this is hard, that the view that you hold may have holes, but you don't know it has holes because you haven't looked for them. Yeah. Yeah. Wrap it up. One, one or two, one, one piece of advice you would give to listeners about the, the whole blog versus journalism question and how to, I guess, how to make sense of it as they go about their daily web surfing. Kathy? Um, look at sources. So if someone is saying X, look for their sources. And this is like if you're looking at Wikipedia too, look at the sources. And I get really annoyed with blogs that only link internally. And every link on the page is to a story or something that they've already written. I want links that go outside so that I have a better feeling of how well-rounded is this person? How biased is this person? How, how fleshed out is this story? Look at sources. Okay, that's, that's very sound advice. Karen? I took the easy um, one. It's pretty simple. We, we've, been, we've been talking today about where blogging intersects with journalism. And as a result, we haven't talked at all about commercial marketing blogging. And if you're looking for the truth and you're looking for really great information, don't get it from somebody who's selling something. Get it from somebody who is impartial, who is a consumer. Um, who it, The two things you want to look for when you're looking for, for good information on the Internet is are you getting it from someone who's an actual consumer, who's been there, who has hands-on experience, and are you getting it from someone who has a similar viewpoint to you? Um, I'm always amused when I go to a restaurant and I look at the Yelp reviews and and the person says to me, they had all this weird raw fish, except it's a sushi restaurant and I love sushi. So I'm looking for the review from the person who says, I've eaten at every sushi restaurant in Seattle and this guy does the best hamachi. So again, you look for someone who has hands-on experience and you look for people who has a viewpoint that's related to yours. Very good, very good. Ladies, thank you. Uh, Karen Anderson and um, Kathy Gill, thank you so much for being on this edition of the Mac Jury. Uh, or Mac Voices, sorry. You, yes, you've got my head spinning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and about the only thing I'll say is you need to get your opinions right here because I'm completely unbiased and I know what I'm talking about. You think that'll we fly, agree, ladies? We Chuck. Okay, Thanks, Chuck. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.